Shalom, shalom. I am Pastor Juanita Weiss. Shalom. I am Rabbi David Weiss. We bring you greetings from Malchul Chaim Messianic Congregation in Chesapeake, Virginia. Yes, as always, it's such a delight to be with you, to share with you another just installment in a time to bless, right? Ashrei is all about being fortunate and being happy and being joyful. Why? because we belong to Yeshua. And so that no matter what happens in our lives, right? It can be a moment where we can be blessed, where we can realize that there's such good fortune in the state that we are in. Why? Because Yeshua is with us. Mm, yes. I just love that, that, that uh, when Yeshua is with us, we have a shalom. Yes. We have a peace. We have an ashray, a blessing yes. and a joy. Yes. That he's he's our he's our protective cover. He takes us by the hand out of out of any fire we are in, and uh, we we trust in that. Yes, we do. We do. You know, um, in our last actually, it was a Bible study, and we were uh, in the the epistle of of James, and there was something that was said. It was just a time of meditation for all of us where. We talked about um, how Hashem is for us, right? I mean, that it was such a, re um, a revelation. It's like, I, that's what I knew. But, you know, in that moment where something becomes like Rhema for you, it becomes mm. a word for you, um, and it brings revelation about the character of our God. Mm -hmm. Well, when we were talking about this, the idea is like he is for us. He is not out to hurt us. He's not out to get us. Even with the distresses and the things that we endure and we go through, they're not to harm us. But he knows, right, through the power of the Ruach HaKodesh, through partnering with him, that we can endure this, that we can persevere, that we can make this. And in the midst of all of that, in the midst of that is this ashray that he calls us to, this, this, this place that is um, not independent, not dependent on anything else that we're going through. It's not even dependent upon the distress that we're going through. What it is dependent upon is our relationship with Hashem. Right. Mm, it could yeah. be the most hor horrendous thing we've gone through. And and I know that all of us have testimonies if you're listening about some difficult things that you've been through. But even in in that, it's not the situation per se, but it's the character. It's what he's forming in us. And through that formation, we get to endure and we get to see Hashem in a way that we've not seen him before with every trial with every test with every difficulty it's it's meant yes to grow us but the only way that we grow really is by our encounter with him by becoming like him right <laughs> i i think that's so amazing it's what he wants for us and in the midst of that he says basically i am for you i am for you this is not to hurt you it's not to harm you maybe harm will come out of it, but that's not the intent of what you're dealing with or why he's allowed this to come upon you. The intent, he's always about the heart, always about the neshama, right? All about us um, uh, becoming like Yeshua. You know, it's like uh, that Yeshua would be formed in us, as Rav Shaul says, that Messiah 
it be formed in us. And that's what it's all about. Wow. You know, as you were talking, you reminded me of the scripture that says, no weapon formed against you shall, shall hurt you, shall harm you. And I'm thinking the worst weapons, the worst weapons of, of the enemy of Hasatan uh, are not ones that would that could draw blood, but they really are the ones that could draw faith, draw mm, our faith away, yeah. you know, and drain that faith and yes. let us lose hope. Yes. As long as we have hope in the Lord and our faith is strong, we will trust him through this life and into the next. And, yes. you know, should Yeshua tarry, we will pass from this life. And that's the greatest thing that the greatest gift God has given us is, is, is to have a hope in him and yes. that he has always made good yeah. when he has said that he will bring us through. Yeah. And that hope makes not ashamed, beloved. I mean, just pressing into Yeshua. And it's so, I, I just wanted to go into our special guest today because mm. I just feel like what I have said today and what you've said as well uh, about this, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, right? Uh, and what's interesting about that scripture is that the weapon will be formed, right? Mm -hmm. it, it will be formed, but Hashem says, the one who forms the weapon is the one that I created. I created the one who forms the weapon and therefore I, I am in total control, right? I am the supervisor, the master mashiach of everything. And I'm the one who controls even the one who forms the weapon. And so no weapon formed against you shall prosper because every weapon that is formed and even when it's dislodged, if we are in Hashem, is that Ashray again? If we are in Hashem, that's why, you know, Yeshua says, um, blessed are you, Ashray, when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manners of evil against you for my sake, for great is your reward. He says, in the midst of that weapon being formed and that weapon being released against you, it will not prosper as long as you endure. Endurance is the key. Endurance wow. is the key. Yeah. It's so amazing. Uh, but I, I wanted to talk about that because endurance, actually, that idea of perseverance is um, one of the descriptors, if you will, of our special guest today. Um, uh, she's endured. She's persevered. And she's learned to live in this place of ashray, right? Of, of, of joy in the midst of all the struggles, because I know that her hope is in Yeshua. Wow, I right? can't wait to meet her. I know, right? So let's <laughs> so let's bring her on and we'll add her to the stage. No other than Bernetta Antonia. Hey son. Shalom. 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 So what do you think about that introduction we had for you? I love that. <laughs> we can't wait to meet her. I know. <laughs> all right, audience, audience, we've known her all of her life. Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. So it's such a delight to have her with us today. She is the Minister of Music at our congregation, and I'll let her tell the rest of that um, because she's going to share with us today how she came to embrace, you know, uh, Jesus. And then uh, upon that, now the Jewishness of her faith and, and actually what that means to her. And then we're going to have such an exciting time at the end because we're going to talk about her missions trip and we're going to bring uh, two others. And it's just going to be amazing. This is such, such a great time. So without further ado... Uh, Vernetta Antonia Case, <laughs> could you share with us how you came to faith in Jesus? And everybody looking at you, they're going to think you're like 18 years old or something like that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, we, we know, uh, yes. But anyway, she has uh, endured a lot, right? She's persevered a lot. And she has learned to live in Ashray. She's still learning, right? It's always a uh, a learning momentum. But anyway, so um, 
Mia, tell us about your journey into knowing Jesus. Okay. Well, first, I like to say just thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to tell my story and be a witness of just the healing power of God. Mm -hmm. And um, I was raised in the church, so I feel like I was always, I always knew Jesus. I always had a knowing of Jesus. But as I grew older, and you'll hear from my story, I learned that I didn't really know him. I knew of him, but I didn't have a relationship with him. And uh, yeah, so I grew up in the church. My mother was an evangelist in the Kojic church and she was a powerful evangelist. I wanted to go with her everywhere. Um, I learned to play the piano so that I could go with her. So I played for her whenever she went to speak or had events or to teach. So I had that opportunity. And from there, I was always playing in the church. And so I was always in the church, Sunday, Monday, Wednesday, I'm exaggerating, but I was always in the church. I had a fear of God, but it wasn't Yurat. It was Pakat. It was, I was afraid. I was always feeling shameful and and just unforgiven. I didn't have a sense of forgiveness. I just uh, was bound by shame and unforgiveness. Um, I... Uh, followed the rules without question, the rules of the church without question, and I didn't have an understanding, and I don't know why I didn't really seek that understanding, but um, as I grew older and I, I went to college, and in college, I discovered a world outside of the church, and the fear of God just decreased. I was getting into unhealthy relationships. And um, again, remember, I'm still bound by shame and unforgiveness. So at this point, when I was in college, I just had no a desire to know God or even go to church. I stopped going to church for a little bit. I moved away from family and friends because I felt lost, abandoned, just burdened by this shame and unforgiveness. But I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was there at all. And um, when I, a uh, few years after living in, living in Philadelphia, um, my mother and my aunt helped me, my aunt, which is Pastor Juanita Weiss, helped me get back to Virginia because I just wanted to come home after a while. And I came home at, um, and like I said, I was just lost. I had two children. I was two children. I was a single mother. I was lost. I was burdened and bound. But um, through my mother and my aunt, these powerful women of God who really loved had a love for her shim. I saw and I was exposed to them just exploring the word and staying in the word. And and um, I, I, I wanted that. I, I, I think I lived vicariously through them. So I followed them both around and, and with being able to follow them around, I still didn't really have a relationship for myself, but I was being exposed to all this knowledge and wisdom and and uh, because I didn't have an understanding of the word, I, I was in church all my life, but I didn't have an understanding of the word, only what was presented. I never really studied it for myself. Um, but here, when I was following behind my aunt and my mother, when they were doing their different classes and teaching, my aunt taught at a Bible college and I got to take free classes. I was doing free seminar. And um, my mom had a Bible college, so I went to her classes. And um, just through being in relationship with them, I just saw, again, I saw their love for God and I wanted that, but I didn't know how because I didn't understand the word. It was confusing to me because it didn't match up to what I learned from the church. 
And that just being exposed to that just gave me um, more initiative and planted seeds for me to start seeking for myself. And um, that's when I learned that the Bible wasn't originally written in English. And I was like, that kind of, that really blew my mind. I didn't even have an understanding of Israel. I didn't know anything about Israel. And um, that really blew my mind. So I ended up going to Messianic congregation with my aunt and uncle. Um, and there, man, I was just, it kept me really intrigued to see all these people just digging in the word and loving on one another and loving God. And it was just like, wow. But I was still in a deep place of uh, just bound by depression and mental health issues. So I, I think just being there was really keeping me afloat. And it, it really started doing things in my heart and forming, allowing me to see God in a new way, like you said earlier about how that through all that we go through, through the depression I went through, through the mental health issues that I went through. In the midst of it all, it's like God was showing me he was not who I thought he was. He was like revealing to me this loving father who heals and who, like you said, wants us to, wants the best for me. And it's like, I just, over the years, I discovered that. And through the mezzing, just through being around and in fellowship with my aunt and uncle, that's how I came to faith in my Jewish Messiah, Yeshua. Yes. Yes. And the story goes on. <laughs> yes, it does. And I know we can attest to the fact that you are a, a student of the word and you dig for yourself, you search for yourself, uh, you learn Hebrew, you've written songs. And so we, we've just seen the growth in you and we're so blessed by what Hashem has done. But isn't it exciting that he has so much more for you? Yes, it, it is. is. It's very exciting. Yes. And even this missions trip, that yes. could, could you could you tell us about this trip that you're going on very very soon, and um, yeah, share that with us. Who would have ever thought me going to South Africa? I know exactly, exactly. <laughs> it is uh, most people. I mean, I found out that my nickname Nia actually means purpose in Swahili before I even had the desire to go to South Africa, but I just thought that was in interesting. And um, this trip is, uh, I'm going with my job, Agape um, Consulting International. We're a nonprofit behavior therapy company. We work with children with autism and disabilities. So in Africa, we service people here in the Virginia, uh, beach area, Norfolk and Chesapeake. But um, in Africa, they don't have the services that we have here. So sometimes children with autism or children with disabilities get abandoned, abused. They don't, they end up not going to school. Um, and a lot of it is because of the cultural beliefs. You know, there's ancestral worship and uh, different kind of things that we're learning. Their perspective is like one family that we've already helped. Their family believe that the autism was brought on because of a curse that was over the family. So they don't try to get that child help or they don't support the child like the child needs. And we're going over there to diagnose these children to make sure they get the services that they need and train the teachers and the pastors that are there to work with these children so that they can live a life like, you know, live a good life because everybody deserves that. And I, I believe that wholeheartedly. So that's what we do. And that's yeah. what we do. 
Yeah, I, I'm personally, I am so excited for you because I just remember your journey to have a voice and to find your voice and to see you partnering with others so that children could, whatever degree that they can, could, could find a voice. So I, I just... I am so in awe of what Hashem has done to bring yes. you to this point of traveling over 20 hours. Uh, wait, yeah, that's right. Yes! <laughs> uh, only just, God can do it. <laughs> only God, only God. I mean, if if they, everyone really knew who's listening that, that you're even going and your excitement about it is is a miracle right uh they would just be so happy for you and and just uh, really see hashem in such a greater way because it's it's clearly him it's clearly him yes. so yes. yes um so you're going to i know that uh, uh this week this weekend we're going to be having something at our congregation. So you might, would you share a little bit about that uh, yes. to support you and what you're doing? Yes, we're going to have um, our uh, church congregation, Kingdom Life Messianic Malchut Kaim is hosting um, a worship night. And there we're going to um, just bring awareness of autism and we're raising funds. We're going to bring awareness to what we're doing. There'll be some information to share. We're going to answer some questions because um, there's a lot of people, a lot of children, a lot of families out there that just don't know what's available. Yeah. And um, we're just trying to bring that awareness of what's available and just an awareness of what autism is and to raise funds for the trip, which is going to go to not only going to fund the trip, but it's also going to go to the school. So uh, to the schools, uh, because there's a lot of needs in these schools because they're in low income areas and poverty stricken areas. You know, um, sometimes you think, um, you know, when Hashem uses us, it's like he sends us out and it's strictly right sometimes to carry the word. Sometimes he sends us out strictly. I just want you to feed these people right out. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then now it's like, no, I want you to minister in the skills that I have allowed to be developed in you. I want those skills to be used. And I know that you will go with the love of Hashem for these for these young people and for what he's called you to. So that is absolutely amazing. And I know that you'll carry the very presence and the very character of, of Hashem as you go. So, yeah, I'm very I'm excited. I'm hoping to sing with them because I've always had a love for uh, African music, African gospel music, because the Africans, when they sing, they dance and it's so delightful. They don't even have to have instruments. No. So I'm hoping I've learned some songs and I'm hoping to get to sing and dance with these children and just have that moment of love and joy with them, you know, embrace them where they are. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I know the feeling because when I was in Zimbabwe, <clears throat> I had an opportunity to dance. Uh, with uh zimbabweans with our people actually so it was it was beautiful it was absolutely beautiful yeah if i can just add nia i think uh i think god has been setting you up all of your life really uh to to um bring you to a place and that is south africa to the place you're going to minister to those very areas that he's made you very sensitive to and mm -hmm. uh and i i know he's going to do a great work through your, through your trip and, and your, your, your offering of everything you're bringing. Yes. Well, uh, what's so exciting today about this uh, particular show as well is that um, uh, with my, my connection with Ahava to me and uh, Yeshiva Chuvu and Uri Africa, I've gotten an opportunity to meet um, uh, several people from South Africa and they are just so amazing. And I wanted you guys to connect in whatever way you 
could and whatever they can share with you by way of um, their being indigenous to the area. So it, it's amazing. But first of all, because this young man shares also not only this uh, um, messianic understanding of his faith, but also has a passion for music and, and, and ministry uh, of music, we wanted to definitely bring him on as an amazing worship leader. Shalom, Billy, just, uh, just a returning, we love it. And we always love for, to have you on our show. Shalom, Ritabale. Shalom, shalom. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, really, really great to be here. It's, it's our pleasure and our delight. Uh, and of course, we wanted to bring on uh, Carla. Carla's been with us before, and she has such a passion for Torah. Even how she uh, came to embrace it is so amazing. I, I don't think... Uh, I met anyone who has embraced it the way she has embraced it. And so, uh, Carla, thank you so much for being our returning guest. Thank you so much for having me again. It's lovely to be here. It's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. So today we wanted to, uh, uh, to discuss, first of all, is there anything that either of you would like to say to Nia as she prepares uh, for her trip? Uh, Ritabale, we'll start with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So one thing I like to um, remind myself of whenever I'm going on a journey, it doesn't matter if I'm going down the road, going to work or traveling, like when I went to Zimbabwe, like you mentioned, um, God goes before you. You know, I think when you, when you keep that in mind, sometimes you're really nervous about the conversations you're going to have, the people you're going to see, or what you're going to have to do when you get there. But if you just keep in mind that God goes before you, um, and one of the passages that comes to mind right now is uh, when Yeshua says, do not worry about what to say when they bring you before, you know, courts or governments or this or that. And uh, not that that's what's going to happen. Don't worry. No. South Africans are very, <laughs> South Africans are very friendly. Uh, I, I really doubt that anybody's going to drag you before a court. But um, God is going before you. He is going okay. to open the doors. He's going to make sure that the way is smooth and the way is straight. And just trust in that. Trust in the fact that he has already ordained this moment to happen. Yes, yes. So therefore, everything is going to happen as it's supposed to be. Uh, he's going to put the right people in your path. Amen. Carla? Amen. Well, having met Nia, I can just say she's a, such an amazing person. And I just know that my country is going to be so blessed <laughs> by having her here, by coming to share her, her passion and her experience and her love for these children, which is a sad fact that our government does not support. So I wish I could see you in person while, we, while you're here, but I'll be praying for you and thinking of you the whole time and and hopefully we, we can connect again. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Carla. So today we're going to uh, discuss um, Parshat Kitetse, right? Parshat Kitetse. And um, of course, I just had shared with you guys some questions that would facilitate our discussion. So first of all, we're going to go ahead and bring the Torah nugget um, uh, to the stage here, and then uh, we'll read it, and then we'll we'll share and hear what the young messianics have to say. <laughs> okay, so this is uh, Parshat Kitetse. It means when you go out, and you can see exactly where it's found in the Torah. And I've entitled this "A God of Judgment and Mercy." Wow, that Amen. was enough. <laughs> It certainly is. And it covers uh, Devarim 21.10 to 25.19. 74 of the Torah's 613 commandments or misvot are in this Parsha. When we would look at the laws of Torah, some of them appear to be very harsh. And some readers would say even cruel. But because of who Hashem is, not only will you find his love and mercy Behind each mitzvah, even when he reminds us that he must judge sin. If he did not judge sin, he would not be God because that's part of his name. His character in the 13 attributes we find in Exodus 34, 6 and 7. When we had no ability to expunge our own sins, 
God, who is mercy and full of mercy, allowed those sins to be carried on the back of his son, Yeshua. In this Parsha, we see the story of the captive woman and how even in this scenario, we see Hashem's attributes. The scenario is played out ultimately as we see in a greater picture of how Hashem took the captive woman, allowed her to grieve her former life, and then made her his bride. For the son who was stubborn, rebellious, a glutton and a drunkard, although we find no historical evidence of this particular commandment being carried out, we know that one stood in the shoes of the disobedient son mm -hmm. and took the punishment that was mm -hmm. his. Mm -hmm. Although some of the commandments may seem harsh and cruel to the one who has not known the father's heart, I believe that Hashem wanted us to see the awfulness of sin against the backdrop of the greatness of his love. Amen, amen, amen. So let's uh, let's talk about this. Now, uh, as we uh, saw here that 74 of the 613 commandments, the mitzvot are right here in Parshat Ki Tetze. Now, as you were looking over them, um, did you see any that were like, um, if not cruel, if not harsh, it's like you were like a little taken aback by? Um, so let, let's let start with our, our guest, our special guest here, Nia. Uh, were you taken aback by any one of these commandments? Yes. The first of all, the rebellious son. Um, at first, I was thinking with the mindset that he was young, but if he's being a drunkard and glutton, then he's probably a little older. Mm. But um, still, <laughs> that's a bit harsh. And also the to stone the woman or the man um, who's found um, without virginity or being immor sexually immoral, I thought those were pretty harsh. Okay. Okay. And then we're going to look at them and decide where, where is uh, his mercy? Where is his judgment in all of this? Uh, what about you, Ritabale? So just in general, which, which commandment that I think was really harsh or commenting on Nia's comments? Both. Let's start okay. with the one you thought was harsh. Most of this parasha is... <laughs> <laughs> hectic and it's not all harsh but it's just like wow what is happening yeah. um it i i sometimes feel very nervous of people who read the bible specifically the torah without a proper discipleship <laughs> model because it's so easy to take these out of context especially mm -hmm. living in today's time mm -hmm. uh, it it's just too simple to say oh look at your god this, this is the God that you serve. So uh, if we're touching on, for instance, the woman, the captive woman, uh, I learned that this was not just to say, um, you know, if you if you see a woman and you like her, you know, you can just take her. Because that sounds very demeaning to women and, and that she's now just property and taken into this person's house and she, all she gets is a month and, and grow her nails a bit and, and then she belongs to this man. But how the captive woman and then the unloved wife and then ultimately the rebellious son is all a string of events that can lead from one thing to another is that it's not a license to just marry forbidden women. I mean, later on in the parasha, we're seeing certain restrictions regarding Moabites, Ammonites, et cetera, et cetera. But what we're, at, what we're really talking about here is a, a discouragement to not do something like this. The, the, the commentaries that I read were saying, when a man is in the heat of battle and he sees a woman, beautiful woman, beautiful form, and back in those days, if you didn't want to get killed by, the, by an invading army, you would dress up in your nightwear, so to speak, just to put it in a kosher way. So things that really bring out your best attributes as a woman, so to speak. So this man is in the heat of battle. He's coming across you and he sees something he 
his eyes are really attracted to. So the, the Torah is saying, in that moment, it's very difficult for a man to turn away and say, I'm actually just, eh, I'm a kosher man. I'm going to go on and just do what I'm here to do. So they make it permissible. Hashem makes it permissible to say, listen, if you really think that this is a good idea for you, take her home, let her mourn for a month, let her shave her hair, let her nails grow long. And if you still think after a month of days that this is something you'd like to do, okay, sure. And the idea was that when something is permissible, we as the human nature doesn't necessarily need it right now anymore. It's like, I can wait about it. I, I, I can wait for it if it's not forbidden to me. So that was like the first string. Sorry, I'm taking a bit of time. I know. Yeah, yeah. Let's just do one at a time. I know you can cover them all, Ritavale, because yeah, I, sure. I thank, you, thank you know, so much for mentioning them all. But did you want to say any more about the captive woman? Because that's where you seem to like focus. You wanted to say anything else? There's a lot to be said. Um, <laughs> I wanted to say it, it actually relates to one of the follow up questions that we're going to be discussing okay. later. So okay. for now, I think I'll hold it. It's okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Carla, what about you? So uh, the one that I thought was a little bit cruel was in Deuteronomy 22, 28 to 29, which speaks about the virgin and the minor who is raped. Mm -hmm. And then she's basically forced to marry her rapist. Mm -hmm. And I thought this is exceptionally cruel. And even some of the commentators say this is evil upon evil. But when we look at what is really going on, this is God's beautiful judgment yes. on this terrible situation. And the mercy is evident if you see how it plays out and mm -hmm. how it was practiced in Israel. Yes, yes. Did you, uh, do you want to elaborate on the mercy? Because that's what, uh, that, that would be the next question. Where do you see in that commandment an attribute of Hashem, whether it's his mercy whether it's his judgment, uh, did you want? Right. So yeah. Hashem's judgment is on the man, the rapist. Um, he isn't let off the hook for the rest of his life. He has to pay the father 50 silver shekels. And why pay the father? What did, what did the father have to do with any of this? The Rambam says that all the benefits which accrue to a maiden belongs to the father. So in other words, the father is compensated for the damage to his honor mm -hmm. and the shame and the emotional damage that was caused by this rape of his innocent daughter. She, on the other hand, is compensated by this marriage. This man is not allowed to divorce her, mm -hmm. but she is allowed to divorce him. Mm -hmm. So she doesn't have to stay married to him. She can divorce him five minutes after the marriage and all the marital rights she will still be entitled to. And so she is also compensated. Also, she then has a higher social status as a divorcee than just a shamed woman. Mm -hmm. So there's the mercy in that. Yes, yes. And and um, uh, what Ritabale was saying about, you know, reading this, just going in and just reading it a cold read and like, wow. But to to be discipled in this and to understand as we were saying in the beginning, that he is really for us, right? He's for us. And his 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 uh, purpose is not to harm us, but is to form this the character, his character within us. So yes, uh, uh, Nia, did you want to say anything about where you saw his judgment or mercy in one of the um, episodes that you mentioned? Episodes. Um, well, I feel like that he was, I saw his mercy and his justness because all of these most, I think all of these mitzvot hold us responsible for, mm -hmm. um, the wellness of others mm -hmm. and which you don't really see too many people doing today. We shy away from that because we don't trust others or we get hurt. But to bring, having to bring these people to the city judge and yeah. it's like, I'm responsible for you. So they had to be doing a lot to make sure that the sons are being obedient or the daughter is 
keeping her body clean and staying a virgin because how does to the parents know about her virginity? They were the ones who were to confirm it. So, mm -hmm. or not. So that to me is like, this is, it takes a community involved to make sure we're all staying on the right path. Yeah. Beautiful. Absolutely. So Ritabale, I know you are kicking at the stalls here. <laughs> okay, okay. So yes, I actually had a to say. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, so I wanted to go back one step though, because I, I forgot to actually say the part that I thought was really harsh. I was still commenting on Nia's comment. But the the commandments I thought was harsh was um no there's a few. There's, there's three. No Gentile. Well, it doesn't just say Gentile. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the congregation of the Lord. I'm like, mm -hmm. that's. I mean, yeah. you put that in. You you put that headline in the current war in Gaza or in Israel, and that's like you you you're you're literally asking for anti-Semitism, uh, or you know, no. Um, what was the other one? Like a mamzer. What what we we some. One would call a bastard, but it's not actually a bastard. It's someone from an from a forbidden union. And the third one was um, no one with. This one's a bit That's unorthodox to mention, but yeah. the I want to use the more uh, better term. No eunuch could join the congregation of Adonai. And where I see God's justice, Hashem's justice, and the attributes of His name. I actually found this in um, so in Isaiah where God says, let the eunuch not say that Hashem will separate me from his people. And it's got Hashem's name there. And I was like, wow, this is amazing because yeah. that's, you know, the, the compassion and the mercy. Uh, so it just got me to think, you might look at this on the surface level. I can't join God's people. What does this even mean? And it's not actually talking about being an Israelite or converting to, to, to Judaism. It's talking about marrying into the family in a particular way. So there's there's other things that's there, which is what we talked about to say, don't just read the surface level of the text. There's a need to be instructed. Uh, last thing just on that need to be instructed. You know, uh, Peter says the unstable and the uninstructed distort the words of Paul um, as they do the other scriptures. This is what happens when you just read. It doesn't matter whether it's the, the Torah, the New Testament, when you just come into it uh, with your Western mindset or African mindset, whatever mindset, which is not an instructed, uh, stable mindset, you're going to do injustice to the scriptures. So anyways. Yeah. Yes. So, Thank you all so much, because I really think that idea of uh, as you were bringing out the, the community, this is about community working together. This is about no person uh, getting off easy for any type of infraction or anything that's done. And so let me ask you then about Hashem's, uh, this duality of Hashem's nature in terms of mercy and justice. Uh, could, could you comment on that, even as it's played out in, in your lives or even as you've seen it in, in scripture, this idea of mercy and justice, you know, even beyond the, the Torah portion. Uh, so let's start with uh, Nia. Okay. I think about something I was studying. I was studying Revelations, which Revelations, the book of Revelations. And um, in the chapters 12 through 17, it's like there God is telling the churches and giving all the all the evil they've done and how, you know, he's disappointed in them. He's showing um, just giving him this message like this is where you've gone wrong. But then and that's his justice like you did this wrong and you this is this is how you've become evil and turned away from me but then his mercy is like he's sending these angels not one angel but three angels to tell them to endure and return back and just giving them another chance um even though 
just like in Exodus, these stiff necked people turned away. It's like he's giving them another chance to turn around and come back. Mm -hmm. And we see that so much, especially in my life. It's like I've seen him. I've he's shown me how I turned away from him because of whatever the case may be, discouragement, depression, whatever it is, relationships that I thought was better than him. But he showed me that, hey, you turned away. That's that's not the way that's going to destroy you. And then gave me so many chances to return. And he does that. He gives us so many chances to return and just be cleansed and freed from all the things that could keep us bound and keep us from knowing him. And I, I just find that to be his mercy, his, his grace and his justness. It's like Amen. he knows what's true and what's good for us. So Amen. Amen. He is definitely for us. Thank you, Abba. Uh, Ritabale? I like to think of the mercy, well, in the name of Hashem, the Tetragrammaton. Uh, and when I look at that name, Yudhe you know, if you look at like the paleo, you get a hand revealed, a nail revealed, which is a picture of the crucifixion, which is a picture of justice being done. I, I don't think we can separate the mercy of God from the justice of God, because then all you're going to get is free for all and do whatever you want, or you're just going to get wrathful vengeance all the time. So I think it's a it's something that's so intrinsic in nature. It's like it's woven together, um, and obviously <clears throat> how you behaved determines which which side you're going to see most of the time. But I see it as a beautiful picture of He is merciful, and that's why. Even though justice must be done, we don't have to pay the price for that. Uh, and I think that's a beautiful story. Amen. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Carla? So there's two, two places in scripture that, that declares who, who God is, his true character. And the first one was Moses who said, a God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and right is he. So that talks about his, his main attribute is justice. And the Shema declares who he is. It says, Hear, O Israel, yod He vav He, the God of mercy, our Elohim, the God of justice. God is one. In other words, he embodies both justice and mercy, and it's, it should be like that. Mm -hmm. And where I see it in the Bible is if there's an imbalance, because justice is tempered by mercy, and where it isn't happening this way, um, we see a disaster. For instance, when it comes to David and his sons, mm. um, Amnon raped his stepsister Tamar. Um, Absalom murdered Amnon in vengeance for that. And David didn't deal with any of these issues um, and the vigilante actions. He exiled him temporarily. And then Absalom led a rebellion against David. And um, David's son, Adonai, uh, attempted to usurp the throne, and Solomon had to kill him with a sword. So if David had had crossed his sons at any time, you know, he could have disciplined them, he could have rebuked them, um, and this could, could have the punishment could have um, saved their lives. But he didn't apply justice. He had too much mercy for his children, and that had a generational effect. And that was not not justice. Beautiful. Absolutely. I could listen to you guys all day. So, <laughs> so I wanted to, uh, as you were talking, this idea of uh, you, you were mentioning David and I was thinking about when he does, when he sends uh, with uh, Bathsheba against um, Uriah and he realizes like, you know, in, in uh, the Psalm that it is against you and you only that I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So he realizes, yes, he did this with Bathsheba. Yes, he did it against Uriah. Um, but it was Hashem that he ultimately ascended against. And then he says, you know, it's like, it's according to your multitude of mercies, blot out my iniquities. So he knew, 
he was calling upon this merciful God. Well, what does this merciful God has, have to do for one who is holding such a high position over all Israel? Uh, and we see that the result um, was to his son. His son dies. And I know that was really a result of David's sin, but Hashem allowed that, right? And in that was judgment, right? And But what's so beautiful is I think was what we miss oftentimes is that within his judgment, I think you all were saying it though, but within his judgment, there is mercy, right? Without, as you said, because it's so intrinsically etched in who he is. It's, it's, it's his nature, justice and mercy. And without that, even in his anger, there's, there's mercy. Even in driving out um, Adam and Chava out of the garden, there was mercy, right? Even in the galut, right? Even in, in that we find his mercy. And it's, it's absolutely astounding. So, but I wanted to ask you one more question since we only have a few more minutes, uh, give each of you a, an opportunity to answer. Uh, we go back to the captive woman, right? And uh, Ritabale, you gave us a great synopsis of, of that woman. Nia, you gave us a great synopsis of that rebellious son and uh, being brought out uh, and notice all the things that he had to have done according to the sages. You know, he had to have been this, uh, this drunkard, had to have been uh, rebellious and, and there were four, four sins actually. But can't, let's take a look, especially because of those of us from the nations and we'll have Rabbi to speak on uh, Israel. Where do you find, and you, you can just do one, um, in the nations, where do you find this image of the captive woman? Where do you find this image of the rebellious son? So we'll just do one of those um, for each of you and, and you can share with us. Mia, we'll start with you. Um, I think for this question, I have to defer to Ritable because I have to ponder on that a bit more. I'm sure he has a lot to say about it. <laughs> He's kicking at the stalls, you think? <laughs> Ritable. Um, I would have loved to start with the Israel one, but I will reserve that forever. I know, we, uh, you know, we can easily do that, right? We can easily. So, but let's start with the nations because that yeah, would involve absolutely. us, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, with us, we are that captive woman. I mean, uh, in the sense that Israel has gone to war against a nation. And this would not be one of the Canaanite nations, but this would be one of the faraway nations. And so it's kind of like proselytizing. And um, I like, I'd like to bring in the third element. I know that you didn't ask this, but the third element of what does it mean to me? Um, one of the teachings I heard this week regarding this uh, sparked up something I, I, I'd forgotten is that ultimately the, the ultimate enemy, whenever you're going to war, is the Yetzirah, the evil inclination. And, and how even though, okay, we are the captive woman and that Yeshua has come and captive, uh, he, he's found us and he's brought us in and he's put his mantle over us and all of that. But I said then daily as I go about my life, go to war against the Yetzirah. I guess the first, the first step is to actually go to war. Sometimes we let the evil inclination have its way and we don't actually go to war against it. So I guess the first step is go to war against the evil inclination. And once you're there, you come across something that you've taken captive. And uh, the, the teacher I was listening to was saying, there's these small wins that we make every day. Um, it could be you know, waking up earlier today or not watching that show, whatever the case might be, and not trying to take on everything, but I'm gonna take this captive. And when I do take this captive, and then how do I behave and how do I move forward? So if I could put it that way, I would liken us as Gentiles to Ezekiel 16, where um, Hashem is saying through the prophet that we were like, in the day of our birth, we were thrown away, worthless, our umbilical cord was uncut, um, and he washed us, he cleaned us, he took us in, he put his, his mantle over us. So I see the whole Bruce Boaz, 
I see the whole um, kinsman redeemer and just, you know, being brought in and being given something of worth. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ritabale. Uh Carla? So um, this commandment reminds us that before God, all human beings are stubborn and rebellious sons and daughters, right? Right. We are all... <laughs> We are all wayward and disobedient to our Father in heaven, and we've all merited the death sentence just like the rebellious son. Because in Romans it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. So to save us from this due punishment um, assigned to the rebellious son, God gave his own obedient son to face the death penalty on our behalf. Mm. And Rav Shaul says the free gift of God is eternal life in Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, in Romans 6. So the only son of God, utterly obedient to the father, received the penalty due to the many rebellious sons. Yes. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Um, Rabbi, she wanted to talk about Israel, the captive woman. The rebellious sign. Yeah. Well, I I see that uh, that God, as you you said it so well, uh, Pastor Juanita, the uh, God is a God of mercy and justice, and they go hand in hand. Um, because to only have mercy is is to have a lawless society, and to only have justice is to have a harsh society. And so, as as God uh, offers a way out. He offers a way out. He offers boundaries through Torah, and he offers a way out through mercy, through turning away, being given even a second chance. And I'm reminded of when Israel is described in the prophets as uh, a, as an adolescent who has uh, reached the age of sexual maturity, was made beautiful as his bride, and, uh, and then went whoring after other gods. And so in some ways, Israel is removing herself. Even Israel is removing herself from God's goodness. And yet God is willing to take her back when she returns. She deserves justice, but she is given mercy. Mm. And, and just as the Torah says many times, that no one can pay the re- no man can pay the redemption yeah. for another man's life, and what does God do? He makes a way. He never included himself. He was the redemption for a man's life because God is no man, and so even as Yeshua is fully man, he's also fully divine, and there is God making a way out uh, for for Israel who went after other gods to be brought back. He pays the price for her, and she is made clean and redeemed. And I, you know, it's interesting to think of. Oh, 50, I'm 50. almost done with time. Yes, oh, we are, are, we are Lord. over. <laughs> well, hallelujah! I'm glad I got a little say in. And uh, thank you all for being on, on our show today. Yeah, <clears throat> we, we come back again, please. Blessings, and I'm sorry uh, it's so abrupt, but blessings to all of you. Nia, have an amazing trip. We'll be praying for you. Amen, amen, amen. Sorry. Here we go. If you missed today's show or want to watch it again or want to tell someone where they can watch this episode, go to lambnetwork.tv. There you will find this show and all the other live Lamb Show archives in the on-demand section of the website. Thank you so much for watching. And don't forget to tell someone about the Messianic Lamb Network. We are richly blessed to bring you what we believe is the fullest, most diverse, yet up-to-date progressive teachings, discussion, and prayer programming you can find anywhere on this planet. Be sure to take the tour of the MessianicLambRadio.com website. 
I'm Susan Hoogie, thanking you for joining us on the Messianic Lamb Video Network. Oh, yeah, hello,